Sports, the station bringing you tag for swag. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear stories from John Russell and Brian Lynn. John has a story about the way the U.S. state of Colorado is thinking about reusing wastewater to solve the problem of not having enough rain. Brian tells us about a new plan from the U.S. Commerce Department related to the sale of powerful computer processing chips to China. Some companies that make the chips are worried about their business if they cannot sell to China. After that, I have a story about how Zimbabwe worked with small farmers to produce the country's largest ever wheat harvest. Following the Africa story, my colleague Andrew Smith has this week's higher education report. He looks at how small colleges are using the internet to borrow courses from large universities. And there's still more. If you like dessert, you will want to listen to Ana Mateo's words and their stories. She looks at a very sweet American idiom. And now, here's John Russell. Colorado's Water Quality Agency recently gave early approval to rules about direct potable reuse. It is a process of treating sewage and sending it directly for use without first putting it in a large water body. Should the move be approved in a final vote in November, the western state would become the first in the United States to adopt direct potable reuse rules, state and federal officials say. Kevin Reedy of the Colorado Water Conservation Board said that as Colorado's population increases, drinking water reuse is an important way to deal with reduced water supplies. The water reuse treatment process usually involves disinfecting wastewater with ozone gas or ultraviolet light to remove viruses and bacteria. Then the water is put through barriers with very small openings, or pores, that remove solids and dangerous materials known as contaminants. The process is gaining interest as communities deal with long periods without enough rain. While many U.S. states do not directly forbid this kind of water reuse, statewide rules could bring quicker adoption, said Reedy. There are no exact federal rules for direct potable water reuse. However, reuse projects must meet federal health rules for drinking water. Florida, California, and Arizona are now working on rules for direct potable water reuse, and several other states are beginning the process or have existing projects. As the water level of the Colorado River continues to drop, Arizona faces deep water cuts, while pressure grows for California to give up more of its share. Denver and Colorado Springs, Colorado's most populous cities, already recycle most of their water through exchanges with other cities and for non-drinking uses, such as watering parks. Both cities expect to someday reuse water for drinking purposes, but officials are concerned their reusable supplies from the stressed Colorado River soon could face cuts. Greg Fisher of Denver Water was concerned about the time it takes to build a large direct potable reuse system. If you've built a big direct potable reuse system and you don't have it even for a few years, that causes some problems, he said. 
if we are relying on those reusable drinking water supplies to meet our customers' needs, our ability to meet their needs is put at risk, Fisher added. Still, some people in Colorado are already making creative use of recycled water. When Eric Sufert brewed a test batch of beer in 2017 with water from recycled sewage, he was not too concerned about the outcome. The engineering company that contacted him about the test explained the process, and together they drank samples of recycled water. Sufert quickly understood the process was not too different from how water is normally treated. Every river in this country has someone putting in their wastewater after they've treated it, he said. After opening the beer and having a taste, the owner of 105 West Brewing Company in Castle Rock, Colorado, now served it to others. Sufert already knows he can make good beer from recycled water. He is more worried about keeping the cost of business down. I'm concerned that the resources will be there for the planned growth in an affordable way for this region, Sufert said. But as of now, I trust that state officials are working on it. I'm John Russell. The U.S. Commerce Department announced a series of new trade restrictions earlier this month that banned the export of some computer processing chips to China. The restrictions affect not only U.S. businesses selling to China, but also any company whose products contain American chip technology. The U.S. government action has many companies considering how to move forward under the new rules. Bloomberg News recently reported China's government had held emergency talks with Chinese chip manufacturers to discuss how the restrictions would affect their businesses. Companies that depend on imports of high-quality chips have been considering possible harms the U.S. policy could cause. Numerous American technology companies doing major business with China are facing possible severe damage to their profits. Other companies that manufacture technology products in China are having to withdraw U.S. employees because the ban also bars U.S. persons from supporting technology covered by the ban. Internationally, large chipmakers are reconsidering their business with China as they explore how deeply the new rules will cut into their sales. James Lewis is a senior vice president and director of the Strategic Technologies Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. He told VOA the new restrictions seem to be reshaping the market. The Koreans, the Taiwanese, and some American companies are really nervous about it, Lewis said. I mean, everyone's asking, what can I still sell to China? And in some cases, the answer is nothing, he added. The administration of U.S. President Joe Biden has described the import ban as a national security measure. It says cutting off advanced chips from China will help limit the development of Chinese weapons and spying tools. U.S. officials have said such technology could help China create weapons of mass destruction 
and tools to abuse human rights and strengthen its military. But experts note that the same technology that goes into Chinese weapons systems is also necessary for other products, such as electric vehicles. It remains unclear exactly how the U.S. will enforce the ban. The policy mainly targets the most advanced chip technology available. This means that older and less developed chip technologies are not affected. Technology experts have suggested the ban represents a clear strengthening of U.S. efforts to keep China from being able to advance toward technological equality with the United States. In Britain's Financial Times newspaper, U.S. national editor and columnist Edward Luce wrote that Joe Biden this month launched a full-blown economic war on China. Speaking at the Chinese Communist Party's Five-Year Congress on Sunday, President Xi Jinping did not speak directly about the ban. But he did promise to increase investment in areas that would help his country reach technology self-reliance. China will move faster to launch a number of major national projects that are of strategic, big-picture, and long-term importance, she said. In a statement, a spokesperson for the Chinese embassy in Washington said he sees the ban as a U.S. move to use its own technological strengths to limit technology growth in less developed markets. The U.S. probably hopes that China and the rest of the developing world will forever stay at the lower end of the industrial chain, Liu Pengyu said. The U.S. action, he warned, will harm the world supply chain with the final result hurting the U.S. and others. So far, chip companies have reacted carefully to the ban. While recognizing the government's concerns, they have noted they were not given a chance to discuss the policy with U.S. officials before it was announced. Some businesses have also said they have not been informed about how the ban will be enforced. I'm Brian Lynn. The African nation of Zimbabwe said it is close to reaching its largest ever wheat harvest. The country's agricultural leaders say the harvest should produce 380,000 tons, an 80,000-ton increase from 2021. The amount is also 20,000 more tons than the nation requires, which would leave a small supply for future use. Zimbabwe began to farm wheat in 1962. Agriculture Deputy Minister Vangelis Haritatos spoke with the Associated Press by telephone. A lot of countries are facing shortages, but the opposite is happening in Zimbabwe, he said. However, wildfires and expected rains remain a threat to crops yet to be harvested. The war in Ukraine has hurt many African nations who depend on wheat imports from that country and its invader, Russia. A United Nations report says African nations import 44% of their grain from Russia and Ukraine. Zimbabwe's president, Emerson Mangagwa, has described the war 
as a wake-up call. The country's agriculture ministry went to work. Haritatos said Zimbabwe asked hundreds of small farm owners to work together to start growing wheat. The government then worked to improve water availability and provide fertilizer for the farmers. Wheat has taken over some of the farmland normally used for winter corn. Zimbabwe believes it has enough corn stored to help with any future shortages. The country wants to see 100,000 hectares of farmland growing wheat next season, a 25% increase. Haritatos said Zimbabwe's success in growing wheat this year came because of the small farms. He said, Many countries do not believe that operators of small farms can add much to overall production. We organized them into clusters and convinced them it was possible, he said, adding that the war made Zimbabwe realize that we shouldn't rely on other countries for food we can grow on our own. While the country is celebrating the upcoming harvest, which runs through December, there are still concerns. Farmers are worried about damage that could come from heavy rains expected soon. Until then, the dry weather creates the threat of fires. Fires destroyed about $1 million worth of wheat in just one week earlier this month. In an effort to get the wheat harvested faster, the government is deploying harvesting machines called combines to farmers. I'm Dan Friedel. Dylan Smith is in his second year at Adrian College, a small liberal arts school with about 1,600 students in the state of Michigan. When Smith was looking at colleges, he liked the small college environment at Adrian, and the school wanted him to join its football and wrestling teams. But Smith did not think a liberal arts education would help him get a job, so he planned to study supply chain management at Michigan State University which has nearly 50,000 students. Supply chain management is a field of study on how to handle the flow of goods and services from raw materials to businesses. But then, Adrian College added supply chain management to its offerings. That made him change his mind and attend Adrian. I couldn't say no to getting the degree I wanted from a smaller school instead of at a big university where you're looking at 200 students in a class, said Smith. An increasing number of mostly small liberal arts colleges in the United States are drawing students like Smith by sharing courses online with large universities. The move is a way for small colleges to deal with decreasing numbers of students going to college. In the past 10 years, 81 small private colleges have closed in the U.S., and nearly two-thirds of high school seniors now say a college degree is not worth the cost. The information comes from a New America and Third Way study. Rick Ostrander is an assistant to the president at Westmont College in Southern California. He said, course sharing lets us maintain what we are, which is small and residential, but compete on selection and price. 
Hundreds of schools are going to go out of business if we don't figure this out, said Jeffrey Docking, the president of Adrian College. The school has used course sharing to add 17 fields of study in just the last two years, including computer science, web design, cybersecurity, and public health. Parminder Jassal is head of Unmuddle, which is developing technology to make it easier for colleges to share courses. She said, We've been sharing through Airbnb. We're sharing cars. We're sharing everything. Higher education is probably the last place the idea of sharing is finally hitting. Some employers say liberal arts study develops important skills for the workplace, such as the ability to write well and solve problems. But students and their parents worry that a liberal arts education will not be enough to get the kind of jobs they want. Getting a good job was the most important reason students gave for going to college, a study by the University of California at Los Angeles's Higher Education Research Institute showed. A 2021 study by the Federal Reserve found that half of the students who earned bachelor's degrees in liberal arts said they would now choose a different field of study. Through course sharing, small liberal arts colleges can quickly add the technical programs that students want at less cost. Some community colleges and historically black colleges and universities are also choosing to use course sharing. Adrian College says new programs that it has added through course sharing brought 100 additional students over the last two years. That is equal to more than $8 million in the total cost over four years of those students' education. It is also less expensive for a college to pay for course sharing than to hire new professors. For many colleges, developing new programs themselves takes too long and costs too much. The firm EAB estimated that it costs as much as $2.2 million to develop a new study program. The way that higher education has always worked is, if I wanted to offer those courses to students, I would have had to go out and hire a faculty member, add those courses, and see if students would take them, said Ann Fulop, a vice president at Eureka College in Illinois. The school used course sharing to add a computer science study program this year. President Docking of Adrian College said, If we're willing to work together and share some courses, we can offer many, many more programs for very little cost. I'm Andrew Smith. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. On this program, we explore words and expressions in the English language. We give examples, notes on usage, and sometimes we use them in short stories. Today we talk about a popular dessert, cake. Cakes are made by baking a mixture of flour, sugar, eggs, and butter. They come in just about any flavor you can imagine, from chocolate, vanilla, and lemon, to unusual flavors like cherry, coconut, and pumpkin. And do not forget about the icing. This sweet topping also comes in just about any flavor imaginable. We often eat cakes to celebrate birthdays, weddings, and other important events. 
All this talk about cake has brought my attention to a common expression. To have your cake and eat it too. This expression, or idiom, can be used to describe a couple different situations. One is where two good things happen at the same time. For example, a friend of mine loves to read, so she got a job at a library. Now she reads all day long and gets paid. Talk about having your cake and eating it too. We also use the idiom to describe a situation in which two good things happen at the same time, but they don't usually exist together in the same situation. Here's an example: My friend just had a baby. She has a good job that pays well, and now she spends more time with her new baby by working from home. We can say that she is having her cake and eating it too. In both of these examples, we could also use this expression: to have the best of both worlds. Now, here is another form of our cake idiom. We also commonly use it in the negative form. You can't have your cake and eat it too. In the negative, it means you cannot have or do two things at the same time that are impossible to have or do at the same time. You must decide which one you want because you can't have both. In other words, you cannot have two conflicting things. For example, let's say your friend is complaining about the amount of taxes he pays, but at the same time he complains about the lack of services the city provides. You could say to him, "Look, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Better services cost money." You could also say you can't have the best of both worlds. Another similar expression is you can't have it both ways. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Also means we should not try to have more than is reasonable. In other words, you can't possess the cake and eat it at the same time. Once the cake is eaten. It is gone, and that's the end of this words and their stories. If you want to get caught up on world events and practice your English, you can come to VOA Learning English. Here you have the best of both worlds. You can have your cake and eat it too. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. Thank you, Anna, for that sweet story. I'm Dan Friedel, and you're listening to the Learning English broadcast. I'll be back in a moment, but first, my colleague Ashley Thompson is here with some more information about a new program from Learning English. VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions and experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. Thank you, Ashley, and that's the Learning English broadcast for today. Thanks to my colleagues, John Russell, Brian Lynn. Andrew Smith and Anna Mateo, and thank you for listening. You can learn more about us at learningenglish.voanews.com. Be sure to join us again tomorrow to keep learning English with stories from around the world. I'm Dan Friedel.